Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for being with us today. My name is Alex Pavlovich. I'm the product marketing lead for Nokia Deep Field's portfolio of network intelligence, analytic, and security applications. Today, I'm your host and moderator for this uh, very interesting webinar, I hope, in which we are joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Craig Labovitz, who is our chief technology officer, and Guy Fabregas, who is product manager and uh, lead consulting engineer for the region of Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background about the two of them, uh, Craig has been a founder of Dfield, which in uh, December 2016, January 2017, became a part of uh, Nokia uh, and specifically a part of IP uh, and optical networks uh, group in Nokia. Uh, so he's, uh, in a way, uh, in many ways, uh, a spiritual leader of uh, this company uh, that he's been leading for a long, long uh, time, and now uh, is in the role of uh, chief technology officer. Uh, Guy, on the other hand, uh, is our consulting uh, lead for the EMEA region, so working directly with uh, a number of service providers uh, in that region, helping them get uh, implemented our solutions to get better insights into uh, their networks and services. So both of them are for Nokia Dfield. By the way, Nokia Dfield is a dedicated business uh, unit in uh, Nokia, focused, as I mentioned, on network intelligence, analytics, and uh, security software applications for service providers, cloud builders, and large digital enterprises. So uh, today we will be talking about uh, the Nokia Dfield Network Intelligence Report, Networks in 2020, which we are releasing today, hence this webinar. And in this report, we are aggregating uh, the knowledge and data we have been working on with service providers globally over the last seven, eight months in a very compact uh, and place where you can uh, take a deeper look uh, whatever happened uh, to service provider networks and the Internet uh, as a whole in 2020, but most specifically as the outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, we will have three parts of the session today. Craig will be uh, taking us through major findings, major uh, network insights, which we recorded between February and October 2020. And Guy will navigate us through some of the uh, use cases that service providers he's working on are uh, using to get even better uh, insights from, from their networks. So uh, I also, uh, being a moderator, uh, would uh, need to provide you with a couple of housekeeping hints. So let me just go over them. I have them printed here. This webinar is being recorded and will be uh, available on, for on-demand watching uh, up as soon as this uh, session is finished. Each of the windows that you see on your screen uh, can be dragged and dropped, uh, enlarged and, and made smaller. So just by clicking and holding down uh, those windows, uh, the presentation window itself can also be resized by clicking on the four arrows at the top right corner. And if you, at any time during the presentation, have questions either related to the content or the technical details or technical issues, please enter them in the Q&A window that you see on your screen and submit at any time. If your question is content-related, we will come back after Gil's presentation to a Q&A part of our uh, presentation today in which we will uh, be answering uh, uh, the questions that are uh, coming from you. And if we don't manage to answer them all, we'll be getting back to you directly over email. As these are very extraordinary times for all of you and all of us, please excuse us if you hear any noise or children or pets in the background. We're all working from home just like you. Also, if our network uh, connections experience any uh, uh, hiccups, please hold on. So uh, with, with that in mind, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, you are in good hands. Craig, uh, Guy, and uh, myself will be navigating you through the session today. So let's start with, uh, with Craig's presentation. Uh, so Craig, as I mentioned, will take us through the key findings. Uh, you may have noticed that between March and June, uh, earlier this year, Craig uh, published a series of blogs with our findings on the topic of the impact of the pandemic on service provider networks. Uh, in this part today, he will focus specifically on what's really new and what are the most important trends that we've noticed during this time. And we continue to monitor the situation and we'll probably uh, end up uh, producing additional uh, findings between now and end of this year. So Craig, uh, I'm now just uh, going back uh, to you and your part, please. Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. 
at the pandemic's impact on internet traffic, we really are asking two broad questions. The first is an engineering one. Much like highways are designed for rush hour, telephone networks designed for Mother's Day, the internet was designed with specific 9 to 11, usually Eastern US, at least in North America, prime time hours. Do we have enough capacity in the network when internet traffic volumes are at their highest? And how did the pandemic impact this internet rush hour? The second question is, what can internet traffic patterns tell us about the pandemic's impact on society? How are subscribers using the internet in different ways at different times with different applications? So when we first started writing about the pandemic back in March, and at least in North America, the initial lockdowns, the immediate impact of the pandemic was significant. Almost overnight, or at least in the space of one or two weeks, we saw traffic peaks grow anywhere from 60 to 80% in some networks, with some providers growing 45% in one week. Now, to put this in perspective, most operators around the world generally build their networks with 30 to 40% growth over the course of 12 months. So it was remarkable in the space of just a few days or at least one or two weeks after the pandemic, we saw a year's worth of internet growth in just the matter of days. And the chart on the left gives some idea of what drove that growth. Certainly video is the dominant application from a traffic uh, bandwidth perspective. But we also saw equally significant growth of even 350 to 600 percent in many of the video conferencing applications, as well as PlayStation, for example, growing 170 percent in just a matter of days. So the major question we had at the end of March was really from an engineering point of view, did we have enough capacity in provider networks around the US and around the world to be able to handle 30, 40% growth. While operators had capacity for at least immediate 30, 40% growth, few had the capacity to grow 30 to 40% week after week, month after month. So the real question was, would that trend continue that you can see in blue in the European Union, in red in North America over the next several weeks? And it's a question both of capacity at peak. It's also a question of how the networks are designed in that for the changing mix of applications, is there traffic capacity in the right place, in the right parts of the network, to and from subscribers? And can you maintain, particularly with the changing mix of latency-sensitive video conference and gaming applications, the same level of quality? as the traffic volumes grow. So the last couple months have at least given us the answer to the first couple of questions, in that the data shows immediately following the major upticks in March and going into April in both North America and the EU, we saw traffic volume stabilize at give or take 20 to 30 percent above pre-pandemic levels. You can also see in the graphs the seasonal effect, which occur every year, typically, of both holidays and summer in the graph. And we now see during the start of the school year, going from September to October, traffic volumes have begun to climb again. Over the next couple of slides, we'll look at several specific categories of applications and what they can tell us about both a engineering perspective and the changing mix of application and usage behaviors. As discussed earlier, the major growth in traffic volumes is largely driven by video, which is in light of blue. But in addition to video, we saw a really significant uptick in gaming, web, VPN usage. 
And while the mix of applications has regional differences, like Netflix versus other video applications in Europe, we basically saw growth uh, throughout all of the applications. While not shown directly in this graph, we did find it of note that mobile traffic flat or declined during the pandemic as more and more subscribers stayed home and were not in transit to and from work or other settings. mentioned a moment ago, networks are really designed with certain traffic patterns in mind. And historically, consumer networks are designed with 80-20 for download to upstream bandwidth in terms of how the circuits are provisioned, how the capacity is designed. So a major question during the course of the pandemic is not just what are the changing traffic volumes, but what are the changing traffic mix distribution? Where is the traffic? And what we're looking at in this slide is the growth patterns for upstream traffic. In the bottom graph, you can see the aggregate view of upstream traffic peaking in March and April, seasonal effect during the summer, and now climbing again during October. Largely driving the uptick are IoT. Uh, this is not perhaps directly related to the pandemic, but part of an ongoing trend as more and more HD, SD, Nest, Ring, etc. cameras are deployed, constantly streaming video up into the cloud. The green shows a great sample of some of the video conferencing with both FaceTime and green and in brown, Zoom, dramatically growing during the early months of the pandemic. You can see the growth occurred March, April, uh, then decreasing and now growing again. Uh, we don't have a great explanation for the shape of the graph. Perhaps uh, subscribers spent much of March and April uh, with video conferencing with friends and family, and then we see the seasonal effect, and now it's growing again as business and school driving the growth in September and October. Uh, this slide shows a little more perspective on video. And in particular, video typically has been consumed uh, in the U.S. between 8 and 11 prime time. In the top graph, you can see the spikes beginning around sort of eight very sharp peaks and then as people go to bed, the video declines with a much flatter graph on the weekends. I think the most salient observation of the graph is the top graph weekend begins to look like every day in the bottom graph. The first graph again is showing the first week of February. The second is showing a representative week in September across a number of providers. And you'll again notice that the curves start, for example, on the 21st, much earlier in the day, and get to a percentage of the peak volume much faster, essentially showing that there is much more video being watched much earlier in the day and much longer throughout the day. While we don't go into great detail in this presentation, it was also a significant shift in how that video was delivered. Before the pandemic, we typically saw 80, 90 percent of video traffic, broadly defined, being delivered from local on-net content distribution network servers. We saw a really significant shift of up to 30, 40 percent during the first several months of the pandemic as video volumes increased where now significant tra traffic volumes came not just from the on-net cache, but really from farther remote caches and from caches across different peering or transit networks. Is, are we seeing greater volume of video just due to the same number of subscribers watching more video, or is it more households watching more video? Now, in our data set, we do not have direct visibility into devices. Rather, most of our data reflects the IP address of the consumer modem, the CPE device. 
But just looking at the distribution of CPE devices per day, we can see a really significant 30 to 35% growth in the number of unique CP watching video each day. I am getting pretty close to a sizable percentage of all subscribers now watching some type of uh, provider-based or OTT video uh, over the internet throughout the course of the pandemic. Of course, one of the significant stories of the pandemic is a great migration from workplace to working at home. We'll shift gears now and look at not video, but look at VPN usage. Typically, VPN usage broadly defined, whether it be SSL, IPsec, or other types of proprietary web-based VPN technologies, were mostly used after hours, starting at 5 p.m. Eastern, going through the course of the night and over weekends. When we look at the difference between the two graphs between February and September, I think the things to note are both the dramatic change in volume, i.e. significantly more VPN usage beginning in, uh, we see in September, but also it's a really dramatic shift in the shape of the graph. In that down below in September, we see almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with the VPN usage corresponding to the business day. You also notice the brief dip uh, around lunchtime in the graphs, and you'll see the weekend usage continue. So really, really significant shift in when VPNs are being used, how they're being used. Really a part of the big story, of course, of the pandemic is the shift from working uh, workplace and, of course, from working at home. While not shown here, we saw an equally significant shift in applications from the enterprise to the cloud, whether it be Office 365 or other applications. I think it's also worth noting that while the shift from working, uh, from working in a workplace to working at home is a really significant part of the story, we also see in applications like Zoom that it's not just about the enterprise. What we're seeing here in a representative network uh, is Zoom traffic you know, over February, April, and September. Prior to the pandemic, video conferencing applications were largely the purview of the enterprise. Notice in April, however, uh, on the weekends, which is the middle light blue shaded, that we see really significant use of the applications beginning not during the work week, but largely driven by consumers at home keeping in touch with friends and families. So really interesting shift in how the applications are being used, when they're being used, and an interesting shift from enterprise to consumer for some of these applications. We'll end with a couple of slides. The first one just looking at gaming. While video continues to predominate the aggregate volume percentage of traffic, we are seeing increasing pressure on service providers around the world driven by latency, jitter, delay sensitive applications like gaming and like video conferencing. What you're seeing here is overall game traffic volumes through the course of the pandemic. We see game traffic both grow but also remain fairly consistent uh, throughout the pandemic. Game traffic here, by the way, includes both the interactive component of gaming as well as helpfully annotated at the top, you'll see the individual downloads and game releases. So really significant growth, uh, 10 to 20%. You'll see some of the spikes when games are released. Uh, increasing pressure on service providers really driven by some of these latency demands. And as we mentioned earlier, some of the issue around gaming is not just the traffic volumes, not just latency, but also one of the sources that is driving some of the upstream bandwidth. Again, typically a fairly scarce resource in most consumer networks, in addition to new and pressing QoE demands. So we'll end kind of taking a longer perspective. 
Some of the questions we're asking during the pandemic are absolutely the pandemic has had an immediate effect on traffic volume, on traffic mix, uh, on the type of applications and subscriber usage. But one of the questions providers are asking themselves is that when and if a vaccine occurs, how many of these changes are structural? How many of these changes will persist? Will consumers continue to use Zoom and other applications, placing pressure on upstream? Will we see the continued growth in IoT? And one of the trends that we've been tracking quite closely during the pandemic is the growth in DDoS. So denial of service attack traffic has predates the pandemic, but we saw a marked 40% increase in DDoS traffic volumes throughout the pandemic. Now, some of the DDoS, for example, is driven and tied to gaming as gamers attacking gamers trying to get the advantage has always been a significant source of DDoS traffic. But we've also seen DDoS traffic grow as a percentage faster than both overall traffic and DDoS traffic. Some of this may be tied to the growth in IoT. As we discussed earlier, uh, both predating the pandemic and perhaps being accelerated by the pandemic has been the subscriber adoption of IoT devices, many of which end up being compromised and a source of DDoS activity throughout the networks. But in upcoming blogs and also presentations, webinars, we'll talk about some of these trends. But clearly the pandemic didn't start the trend of the shift of applications to the cloud. But as we see throughout the pandemic in the report, the pandemic helped accelerate the shift. And indeed, it helped accelerate some of the shift of the application providers. As in earlier reports and blogs, we talked about how Zoom rearchitected some of their delivery in the cloud. And finally, I think the pandemic has helped accelerate the pressure on service providers around the world to be able to deliver not just bandwidth, but be able to have nimble delivery of traffic, to be able to quickly adjust to these different traffic demands and provide continued levels of QE and security even as the pandemic makes significant shifts to where the traffic is delivered, how it's delivered, and the application mix used by providers. With that, I'll hand back over to Alex and Q. Thanks so much, uh, Craig, uh, and luckily I'm back. And uh, my, I, I lost my, my uh, audio for, for a second, and it's quite interesting. And in times like this, our tools are also helping service providers to uh, trim out those customer complaints like this one because I didn't know whether it was my network connection or something happening to my computer. But uh, great presentation. Uh, I would also uh, like to just mention to the audience that we will be releasing a set of uh, mini webinars focused on specific topics, uh, 30 minutes uh, sessions between December and February. Uh, so the first one will be focused on video streaming, the second one on video conferencing and VPN, then we will have one on gaming and one on uh, DDoS security in particular. So please stay tuned. This will be a kind of a capture all uh, sessions that will really uh, put a more focused view on these topics. Uh, with that, uh, I would really like uh, now to introduce our second speaker today, Guillaume Fabregas from uh, Barcelona, Spain. Uh, as I mentioned, Guillaume has been working with a number of service providers uh, uh, worldwide, uh, not worldwide, but mostly in uh, Europe, Middle East and African region. Uh, and uh, Guy will provide us with uh, uh, some of the interesting insights into what service providers are doing with Diffield uh, portfolio, and specifically in the time of the COVID pandemic. Uh, Guy, uh, now to you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Um, so, uh, so far we have heard about some of the major trends we have observed in service provider networks around the world during the difficult times that we have all been facing. And how, even with the very significant growth in consumer traffic and DDoS volumes, the networks managed to deliver in both capacity and robustness. Um, in the second part of the session, we're going to focus a little bit more on how our customers have been using DeepField to help them anticipate the challenges and to continue to meet our needs uh, to stay in touch with our friends and family, as well as having a little fun while watching uh, high quality online content. And well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the quality part depends on what you have all been spending your time watching, of course. 
Um, and um, talking about content, we all know that now more than ever, content is king. And so the good news for all of us who are part of the networking industry is that society has finally become very aware of the important role that networks plays in our lives. Uh, no network essentially means no content these days. Um, but in a distributed content and networking world, how can a service provider regain control about what happens in the network? And the first step towards that is uh, you know, to be able to understand what is happening in the network. Uh, only when we know what is happening, we can actually take informed action. So today, getting that knowledge means understanding what applications and traffic types are flowing through the network and where they're coming from. What path are they taking through the internet and how they're getting into the network? How do they flow through the different layers of the network to get to the customers? And if they're stressing the network in the process in any of these layers? And finally, to know how the customers are consuming them and what quality of experience is being delivered to them end to end. So in the next few slides, I'll walk you through some examples of how our customers have used and keep using DeepField to understand what is going on in their networks and try and stay ahead of the game. So first things first, if content is king, we need to get content visibility back. And so way back when service provider networks were still carrying what now seems to be like very low levels of traffic, Getting visibility into the traffic types and applications flowing through a network used to be done by using DPI technology. However, with the massive amounts of traffic being carried by service provider networks today, it is no longer cost effective, and it hasn't been for a while, by the way, to use DPI to get this knowledge. So what's the alternative? Um, and well, our customers are using DeepField. And with DeepField, they can, on one hand, understand which services are being consumed and how much traffic they represent. They can identify patterns on how the use of those services changes over the course of the day and evolve over time. And they can see where they're coming from, including CDNs, and how they're getting into the network, which essentially allows them to perform accurate network planning and forecasting, such as deciding and executing on the best possible peering strategy or whether to deploy on-net caches from third-party CDNs and where. So this slide shows an example of one of our customers. And very quickly, one can observe three interesting facts. And you know, the first one is that um, Netflix is the top application by far in this network, more than doubling YouTube. And please forgive you know, the small font. Uh, this is a dashboard that we show to our customers. So obviously, when you have it in front of you, you can see it much nicer. But suffice to say that Netflix is above 2 terabits per second in bandwidth. And YouTube, which is the second application in use in these networks, uh, is speaking around 880 uh, gigabit per second. Um, the second insight is that, uh, and it's related to the first one, is that streaming video entertainment takes the top three positions with Netflix, YouTube, and Amazon streaming. And the third one is that um, you know peer-to-peer -peer is back, right? Mostly due to OTT subscription fatigue. Uh, it seems that it is back and here to stay, and it's getting the highest rank for upstream traffic in this network. So let's look at some other examples of what our customers have been observing. And you know, we've discussed about some of these in the earlier part of the session, but these days, you know, traffic patterns in service provider networks have become anything but predictable. Uh, certain events, such as Android and iOS uh, software updates, launches of new online TV show seasons, uh, gaming updates and campaigns, and DDoS attacks can cause tremendous spikes in the network. Uh, as an example, uh, and zooming into gaming, uh, practically anybody who has a kid or teenager at home has learned a new term at some point over the last three years, which is Fortnite. Uh, Fortnite has changed the dynamics and, and business model of the gaming industry with many, many other premium gaming titles and franchises uh, now following a similar model with free downloads, regular campaigns, and even live concert events within the game. Um, the net result is that game downloads are now responsible for the monthly peaks in a lot of networks around the world. Um, and as shown in the example at the top, our customer has been able to track the impact uh, of gaming updates and campaigns for Epic Games and other leading gaming pro providers. Um, this has allowed them to understand how they affect their network and learn from it over time. 
Um, and this has helped them to incrementally get better at preparing for these kind of events. In, in the example shown at the bottom, uh, you can see depicted the impact of uh, a recent YouTube uh, worldwide outage during last week um, uh, in the network. And um, you know, uh, this is in an, another network of another one of our customers. So as it can be seen, customers reacted to this outage by uh, turning to an alternative source of entertainment, which in this case is Netflix. Uh, this caused an increase of 20% of the Netflix traffic peak over the usual volumes. Now, one could just you know, stay with the anecdote, but the reality is that you know, an unexpected jump like this um, in what is already the largest service in most networks around the world could cause a capacity issue uh, if the network is not dimensioned to handle. On net caches, for example, if deployed, could exhaust their capacity for content delivery and any extra capacity required would come from the outside of the network through the peering layer, which could again cause challenges. So is this, uh, you know, is your network ready for the unexpected? Um, and that's, you know, the answer that we all have to keep asking ourselves to keep making our networks better and have them survive what, uh, you know, significant challenges uh, like the ones we have faced so far. So as mentioned earlier, uh, to be able to plan ahead for these kind of events, it's essential to know the path that these services follow uh, you know, through the network to get to your customers. And you know, from this perspective, service providers have been using DeepFuse multidimensional analytics capabilities to characterize how content delivery for uh, these uh, over-the-top uh, services uh, are used by customers. Um, and in the example that I want to talk to you about, I'm going back to gaming. Uh, so as discussed on the previous slide, online gaming has gained a lot of relevance over the last few years, but has certainly intensified during the pandemic with all of us spending more time at home. Um, as a result, gaming traffic is now up to 10% of the total, total traffic in, um, you know, in average in a good number of service provider networks, with the peaks actually causing, uh, you know, caused by gaming updates going way beyond that. Now, this service provider uh, used DeepField to monitor the service delivery path for the top gaming applications. And they were able to see where was the traffic coming from, how it was getting into their network, and where it, in the network it was going to. This, um, you know, this interesting graph that I'm showing uh, shows the service delivery path for the top four gaming applications consumed in the service provider network, what CDNs were used to source the content, which peers were used to send traffic into the network, and through which peering routers did the traffic enter the network, in addition to which access pops at the other end of the network did the traffic go to in order to reach subscribers. Now, as it can be seen from the graph, and again, you know, forgive the small fonts, <laughs> we have to put a lot of information there, um, a lot of applications are using multi-CDN delivery. Um, as an example, Xbox Live uses both uh, Microsoft's own CDN as well as Akamai for content delivery into this network. And PlayStation uses both Limelight and Akamai again. Um, in contrast, for example, uh, Valve uses you know, Akamai for a small part of the service delivery, but most of their content is delivered from its own infrastructure. Um, in this graph, this is shown as CDN equal none. Um, so an interesting thing to notice is that this service provider now has a very good content delivery efficiency. And what, I'm, what I mean by this is that they have direct peerings to all the CDNs and content providers that are relevant for the delivery of these top four gaming applications. Um, this results in a lower cost to deliver the service by avoiding paid transit, as well as a better quality of experience for their subscribers by lowering the amount of hops that the traffic has to traverse from the source to the destination. However, this was not always the case, but by using DeepField to understand uh, and visualize the inefficiencies, this service provider was able to improve their peering strategy significantly while addressing at the same time some capacity bottlenecks in the process. So uh, talking about capacity, um, maybe let's take a look at another example. Right? And as discussed by Craig during the first part of the session, um, monitoring the network uh, to proactively detect and address any potential capacity constraints has been a key task for service providers during this period of accelerated growth. Um, 
our customers have used DeepField's uh, interface capacity monitoring capabilities to identify interfaces at risk of congestion and take preventive measures to stay ahead of the increasing traffic demand, as shown in the example on the left-hand side of the slide. However, a, I would say a mostly unexpected issue has caused, uh, or has been caused by the dramatic increase in uplink traffic. Um, and this has been uh, you know, produced because of all the content being produced and shared from the homes, including video conferencing, as well as, uh, you know, as Craig mentioned, uh, gaming uh, you know, uh, events, gaming campaigns. Um, so as shown in the example on the right, uh, the consumed doubling bandwidth in this uh, region, uh, this is zooming on a particular region in, in, in these service provider networks, um, increased uh, over 70% in just two months. Right? In this case, I'm taking a look at, very re at a re very recent screenshot from the last two months. Right? Um, now, uh, so how that is typically never an issue in the core of a service provider network um, as downstream traffic to the customers is significantly higher than the traffic in the upstream direction and the capacity on this part of the network is usually dimensioned uh, and deployed to be symmetric. However, that is not necessarily true on the access part of the network. With most access technologies used on the last mile being designed, or at least having been designed for a long time, to be asymmetric, matching the usual um, you know, behavior on uh, consumer traffic distribution. Well, you know, the increase of upstream traffic out of the blue caught some service providers off guard. Um, you know, our customers have used DeepField to monitor bandwidth usage beyond the IP network and into the access layer, being able to observe the growth trends not only by access router, so by, say, by BNG or by aggregation router, but also down to the CMTS, DSLAM, and OLT level, and even down to the individual PON level in some cases, helping them outpace the demand for more and more upstream traffic. And you know, when it comes to demand, uh, let's talk about the leading content type. Uh, and of course, you got it. This is um, this is video, right? So, for many years, we've been saying that unicast video would take over the world, and this is certainly a reality today. With streaming video representing well over 50% of the traffic in most service provider networks around the world, and in some cases even over 80%. So it's easy to see how. Understanding the quality of experience delivered to customers for this kind of content has become a necessity. Um, service providers have been turning to DeepField um, to use its ability to monitor the average bid rate of streaming video services to get an objective measure of the quality they're providing to their subscribers. So DeepField can monitor the ABR of a video service, both network-wide as well as per CDN, for example, in the case of multi-CDN service delivery, like uh, is the case for Disney+. Plus. Or it can uh, you know, monitor the ABR per on-net cache that is being delivered to customers to check that you know, every cache is uh, you know, delivering what they should and behaving correctly. It can check that ABR per network region, per POP, per router, per interface, etc. So in addition to that, DeepField can measure the concurrent users per service and the historical trending to help assess the popularity within the subscriber base. Um, an example of this um, that service providers have been uh, able to track with DeepField is the impact, for example, of new service launches, such as Disney Plus or uh, Dazn. Um, and so let's take a look at a concrete, uh, concrete example for this. Um, one of our customers has been using DeepField to understand and very closely monitor how Netflix traffic flows through their network and the service quality that they deliver to their customers. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see the service uh, delivery path for Netflix in their network um, overlaid with um, you know, a high-level topology of their network uh, layers. So they monitored the source of the traffic uh, with off-net uh, traffic coming through peering and on-net traffic coming from their on-net caches deployed in the network. The pops where the traffic was coming in into their network, both you know, peering and data center gateways uh, for on-net caches, 
and how the traffic is transiting through their core and aggregation layers down into the access network. Now, this helps them monitor the usage of their caches and minimize the amount of traffic coming from the outside of the network, as well as validating that there were no inefficiencies on the delivery of the service throughout the network. Um, and they were able to do all this while at the same time monitoring for the Netflix average feed rate and the number of simultaneous stream counts at the same layers of hierarchy in the network, as shown on the right-hand side. As the next step, um, though, and, and you know, tied to the point that I described on the last slide, they plan on using DeepField's capabilities to get visibility into the access network, allowing them to get um, the same kinds of insights further down the service delivery chain into their BNGs, OLTs, and even down to individual ponds. I can see some echo. All right, hopefully that's cleared. Um, so, um, and speaking of granularity, uh, let's take, uh, you know, the next step uh, down the ladder uh, and, uh, you know, talk about uh, subscriber intelligence a bit. So, with it, DeepField enables better subscriber profiling and diagnostics, allowing to get DPI-like visibility down to the subscriber layer without the cost or complexity of deploying DPI in the network. It allows service providers to understand per subscriber and per subscriber group uh, traffic volumes and content consumption patterns, all while being compliant with data privacy regulations like EU's GDPR and uh, California CP, uh, CCPA, for example. Um, so this level of visibility empowers service providers to give a better customer experience by allowing them to proactively identify potential issues, as well as giving their customers a better support when they contact the support line. At the same time, it helps service providers to better plan their network investment strategy, for example, by identifying which regions and profiles have the highest demand over the average. And finally, it assists the marketing and business intelligence departments in better understanding their customer preferences which allows them to improve their offering and packages to address what their subscriber base needs. Over the next few slides, I'll talk about a few examples of how our customers are using these insights. So let's start by uh, you know, talking about aggregate application-aware subscriber profiling. So the service provider in this example is very interested in characterizing the use of the content made by their subscriber base. This dashboard, uh, which again shows very small, uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see this uh, repeat and uh, get the slides. Um, but this dashboard helps them understand at a glance what is the demand for each of the top applications by category by showing them the traffic volumes and number of subscribers for each of them, as well as the variation for each of these metrics from the previous monitoring cycles. Um, they can see this network-wide as well as segmented through different layers in their network, such as regions, POPs, BNGs, OLTs, etc., cetera. Um, and even the breakdown by subscriber groups, such as um, you know, the use of these applications per subscription plan, per speed tier, so comparing um, you know, the different usage that 10 meg, 100 meg, and 600 meg users do of the different applications and categories, or even by access types, such as you know, comparing what the usage is uh, you know, between DSL and FTTH subscribers, for example. With these insights, the service provider can easily track what is important for their customers, as well as monitor important trends and deviations from the usual consumption patterns, um, such as new services taking a relevant position in the top chart. Um, they normally use this information to plan their offering and campaigns and track the success of such offerings and campaigns. However, during the pandemic, this has also allowed them to monitor what are the top applications and events causing congestion and where in the network, assisting them in taking important decisions and actions such as opening new regional peerings, altering the routing and load balancing of their CDN, and even further distributing caches into the top access regions.
Um, so uh, next, let's take a look at uh, another example on this form or of this type of analytics or insights used by a tier one cable operator in the US. Um, they are also using DeepField for aggregate subscriber profiling, getting insights on service consumption by network location, by rate plan, by CPE model and software versions, as well as other uh, key metrics. With this, they're able to, um, you know, well, they are checking how the adoption of IPv6 is evolving in their customer base, segmented by many other metrics. So for example, um, you know, adding IPv6 support in their on-net caches caused a large, you know, of course, positive jump in the percentage of IPv6 based versus IPv4 uh, traffic usage. Um, in addition to this, they're analyzing how their own streaming video offering is being used by their subscribers and how it compares to third party streaming video services. Um, they're also monitoring the quality of service for it. Um, so as an example, and, and you know, there's an interesting issue they faced where you know, they had a significant amount of complaints by users on streaming video quality uh, involving waiting times, uh, you know, pixelation, et cetera. And by looking at the quality of, uh, you know, at several network layers, they couldn't quite put their finger on it. Uh, it couldn't be tracked, uh, you know, to a region, to a pop, uh, an access node, or even an access type. Um, and so, uh, what? However, when 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 looking into this quality per CPE model, right? So another metric, they quickly saw that a particular CPE model had a much worse video average bit rate, pointing to a clear quality issue. So after some investigation, they realized that this CPE had a lower power Wi-Fi antenna, which was the source of trouble within their users' uh, homes between the CPE and the Wi-Fi connected smart TVs. Now, of course, uh, you know, they would not go ahead and, and just replace all of the CPEs, but when customers would call and complain and they knew that they had this type of CPE, then they would proactively offer to go and replace their CPE. Now, so with this in mind, uh, you know, they're feeding this kind of information into uh, their cord cutting uh, prediction engine to improve the business while better serving their customers. And finally, they're also using DeepField to quantify the levels of uh, you know, piracy and theft of service, which you know, is seeing a comeback due to subscription fatigue, as, as mentioned earlier in the session. So on the next example, I, I would like to explore what are our customers doing with uh, you know, per subscriber information. And so having per subscriber insights on traffic volumes and content consumption patterns can help in many different aspects. The service provider in this example is using DeepField to address three main business objectives. One, you know, they're using it to provide better support to their customers. Two, uh, it's giving them visibility to their, uh, into their opt-in subscribers and um, you know, how their traffic and content uh, consumption is uh, used. And three, uh, they're using, you know, similar to before, but in this case, by feeding individual subscriber information, into their business intelligence algorithms. So let's expand a little bit on each of these, right? So on the support side, when a customer reaches out to support and if the user agrees to it, the support operator can access the customer's data and identify strange or potentially strange traffic patterns, such as a subscriber trying to watch an Amazon streaming video over their 600 megabit per second access line and the peaks never going above three or four megabits per second, which will cause um, you know, slow buffering, long waiting times, and possibly a lower picture quality due to adaptive video adapting to the conditions of the line. Um, and, and regarding visibility for their subscribers that have opted into the service, um, customers can have access to their content consumption, consumption patterns in the service provider portal and uh, you know, with the app that they provide to their customers. So for example, um, you know, concerned parents can get an understanding of the kind of content consumed in the home, which may lead, for example, to additional revenues for the service provider in the form of parental, con uh, you know, them hiring a parental control product, for example. Um, and on the business intelligence aspect, the service provider is feeding this information into their big data lake for further processing and enriching um, uh, you know, with all the data sets 
um, of their processes for cost and revenue analysis, capacity planning, offering design, service launches, and much more. Um, all of it at an aggregated level, uh, so as to respect the user's privacy. Um, for those subscribers that have opted in to share the data with the service provider, they can also qualify um, you know, which kind of consumer they are. Um, are they watchers, right? Are they constantly watching uh, you know, uh, streaming video? How many OTT subscriptions do they have? Are they watching Netflix, Amazon streaming, and Disney Plus? Or are they only watching Hulu, for example? Um, are they gamers? Or are they mostly doing peer-to-peer? -peer? So all of these gives them invaluable insights. Um, OK, so next, um, I'd like to talk to you a bit about security. Um, so um, the DDoS threat uh, is ever-growing. As mentioned by Craig in the first part of today's session, we have observed a growth uh, of between 40 and 50% of DDoS traffic volumes during the pandemic, which is massive. However, this trend was clear well before the pandemic as well, with a, an approximately a tenfold increase in DDoS attacks um, of, uh, over the last few years. Um, this has mainly been driven by botnets and hijacked servers uh, as of late. We have been building, or we have been busy really, uh, building high-performing networks to give our subscribers the best possible experience on their digital lives. However, with the easy availability of high-speed internet access, together with the significant rise on the number of IoT devices in use on customer homes, which are you know, typically not well secured, running out of date software, and even in most cases using default passwords, have allowed attackers to build incredibly large attack platforms to be directed at the desired victims at the click of a button. Now, in many cases, these attacks can come from within our network, from our own subscribers. So we need to expand our protection boundary, traditionally done only on the peering layer to the entire perimeter of the network, including the access network and data centers. However, we need to do that while keeping the cost under control. Now, the de facto standard for DDoS protection over the last 10 years has been based on the use of inline cleaning appliances and scrubbing centers, based on DPI technology to detect and automatically mitigate DDoS attacks. However, with the amount of traffic we have in today's networks and with the throughput that current DDoS attacks generate, in many cases in the orders of uh, you know, terabits per second, uh, unfortunately, this model does not suffice anymore, as it has a very large impact on the cost of the infrastructure required to deal with the attacks. So let's explore the reasons for this over the next few slides and how our customers are using DeepField to address these challenges. So first, um, our customers are using DeepField to identify potentially infected uh, customers or unsecured equipment. As discussed before, residential IoT devices uh, typically ship with weak security settings, and these settings are hardly ever changed, as most of them are sold as plug and play, so easy to install and use without much, if any, configuration. The same goes for CPEs that have open ports on the one, which can be exploited by attackers to launch uh, reflection attacks, such as uh, using SSDP on UDP port uh, 1900. So as an example, this, this port is used by uh, you know, UPMP, Universal Plug and Play, to discover devices and services uh, normally within the LAN. But it's often found uh, open also on the one interface of the home gateway routers, um, allowing those CPEs to be used for attacks without even having to be infected. And of course, there's, there's the mobile devices uh, from which users frequently download applications from their respective app stores and marketplaces, which come, unfortunately, with embedded malware. Uh, and these can be later uh, used by the attackers controlling them as a part of a botnet. Now, back to how our service provider customers use DeepField for this. So on the top example, you can see a given subscriber sending large amounts of DNS traffic upstream. This is an extreme case, of course, as you know, this subscriber has a one gigabit per second symmetric service and is generating an average of 400 megabits per second of DNS upstream 
uh, and uh, it's it's mostly a sustained rate, which is not usual. But you know, just imagine, uh, for the sake of it, a few uh, you know a few hundreds or thousands of households with infected or exposed devices, each of them sending just a few uh, megabits per second towards the network. Uh, this can add up to a very sizable attack coming from within the network, which would hit, uh, you know it would hit you completely bypassing the you know the existing security perimeter and without you even knowing where it came from. Now, DeepField helps the service providers uh, periodically identify and uh, you know notify subscribers who are uh, potentially running compromised devices in their households. On the other example, at the bottom of the slide, you can see the effect on a subscriber's mobile quota consumption due to a malware-controlled Android mobile terminal generating a large upstream spike. Now, under normal circumstances, this would cause the user to be built a fortune for going way above their quota, especially if this behavior uh, you know, uh, remains uh, for the course of several days. Um, now, this would lead to customer dissatisfaction and potentially to churn with the associated revenue loss if not handled properly. So DeepField helps service providers distinguish this traffic as malicious uh, and or part of a DDoS attack, which allows the billing dispute team to handle these type of cases for the customers. Now, this could even be automated by proactively reconciling large daily or hourly upstream consumption uh, of the subscribers with deep field data and taking out any malicious and DDoS related traffic before even billing the subscriber um, and thus reducing the amount of complaints and hours spent in uh, you know, going through this type of uh, you know, uh, claims. Now, the second and arguably more important uh, way that deep field helps our customers in this area is by doing uh, or by offering a 360 degree DDoS protection, detecting attacks coming from subscribers and mitigating them right at the edge of the access network, in the BNGs or in cable aggregation routers, for example. Now, this makes your network part of the security perimeter and avoids having to backhaul all that attack traffic to costly, you know, you know, to costly cleaning appliances thus keeping the cost of dealing with DDoS attacks under control. Now, let's look at things in the other direction on the next example, uh, so in downstream. So, you know, here we see typically two types of very damaging attacks. Uh, and, and the first, uh, and, and show at the, in the example at the top, is a large-scale or large-scale volumetric attacks. Right? So these are the most damaging and most frequent DDoS attacks. They include uh, amplification and reflection attacks, flooding attacks, and even large state uh, exhaustion attacks. So due to their large size, in addition to damaging the victim of the attack, they also typically cause collateral damage to the network infrastructure or the customers, services transported through the network, etc. To make things worse, when the destinations of such attacks are your enterprise customers, you could be putting your SLAs uh, or your SLA commitments at risk and likely face fines if SLAs are broken. Um, so the second example um, at the bottom um, it shows the second type of attacks. So with gaming uh, um, traffic on the rise, rivalry uh, also on the rise, but also large prices uh, for gaming being offered to winners of events and tournaments, more and more, we see quick attack bursts oriented at trying to boot the other players out of a game. Anything to win, right? Uh, well, or anything for the money. It depends on how you look at it. So an example of this shown uh, on the bottom graph um, is that these kind of attacks have you know, uh, intensified during the pandemic with more people staying at home. Um, there is now a large choice of DDoS for hire commercial services called, uh, or typically called booters. And these are frequently used by players to attack each other uh, while playing. Now, when talking about these type of attacks, they're not normally very large attacks. Uh, they can be, of course, but um, they are enough to saturate the gamer's access line so they get disconnected from the service. Since they are not large, they usually don't cause collateral damage, but can cause customer dissatisfaction 
And gamers are known for very for being very vocal when complaining about the quality of the service they get from their service providers, which can of course lead to bad press, which nobody uh, you know nobody wants. Um, so how is Deepfield helping our service provider customers in this area? Um, so Deepfield allows making the network part of the solution, as discussed a little bit on the previous slide. It effectively turns all your network boundary, including your next generation peering, data center, and access routers into a main asset to be used in protecting uh, or in the protection of your network and customers. All high volume and large scale volumetric attacks, including amplification, reflection, and flooding attacks, can be stopped right at the edge of the network, while the much smaller application layer attacks uh, continue to be mitigated on scrubbing centers. As a result, the total cost of ownership for DDoS protection solution goes significantly down. Um, in addition, for attacks targeting your uh, subscribers, Deepfield can help deploy and maintain zero touch and always on protection embedded in your access routers, keeping your customers protected at all times. Gamers can continue to smile while they keep winning, or of course, they can continue to be disappointed when they are beaten fair and square by other players. So um, let's look at an example of the security strategy being put in place by um, one of our customers. So this tier one global provider realized early on that you know, due to the large increase in traffic and DDoS attack size in their network, they couldn't keep protecting it um, the same way that they had been doing it in the past. Would they have gone down the same path? The accumulated cost in scrubbing appliances and the cost of backhauling the attack traffic from the routers where the attack was entering the network to the scrubbing centers would have become cost prohibitive. Instead, they put together a multi-tier mitigation strategy where Deepfield would detect all the volumetric attacks and mitigate them on their existing routers and the rest of the attack traffic to the destinations under attack uh, of much lower volume at this point would then be forwarded to scrubbing centers for further inspection and cleaning of protocol and application layer attacks as mentioned. In this case, Deepfield will trigger advanced volumetric uh, DDoS mitigation on routers using BGP flow spec um, you know, for this service provider. It can also use NetConf and BGP black holing. Um, please note that the countermeasures implemented by Deepfield uh, uh, work best with routers using next generation network processor silicon, such as Nokia's FP4 based routers, due to the very high scale layer three and layer four filtering capabilities uh, they have while keeping forwarding packets at wire speed. Uh, so it means we can effectively load many more uh, DDoS filtering rules uh, while keeping uh, you know, forwarding performance. Um, in this network, Deepfield will, will also interwork with um, you know, two different scrubbing platforms uh, uh, in their network for that second tier of mitigation that we discussed. So this multi-tier mitigation strategy was key for this service provider. Not only will this help them reduce the overall investment for DDoS protection, but it will also open the door to additional business opportunities. Uh, as an example of that, um, while in the past, managed DDoS protection services were typically offered only to a constrained set of large enterprise customers, mostly due to the high cost of delivering the service, this kind of service uh, can now also be offered to a much wider customer base for significant further revenue. So how does Deepfield do all of this, you ask? Well, uh, Deepfield is a highly scalable uh, software platform. It is designed and optimized from the ground up for IP networking, analytics, and DDoS protection. Um, to build all its insights, it takes raw network telemetry from uh, you know, your network, uh, including Flow, BGP, SMMP, and others. It combines it with uh, the cloud genome and secure genome data sets which allow classifying uh, data into content types and applications, as well as advanced endpoint and threat intelligence. And it can also, also optionally further enrich the data with custom classification rules that are relevant for the service provider, such as, for example, uh, you know, the ones that we've mentioned, like access type uh, uh, or you know, fixed versus mobile versus uh, enterprise or network regions, uh, et cetera. 
So it processes, it processes all of this data in real time. It stores it uh, in the system and makes it available both to the deep field applications for analytics and security and to third party applications and systems via the northbound REST API. With this, uh, DeepField is able to provide uh, uh, service providers with advanced IP analytics and DDoS protection, like some of the examples we've seen in this session, without the need of deploying any DPI or probes in the network. So let's take a closer look uh, or at the genome data sets. So what is genome? Uh, and, and you know, genome is, is many things, right? It's, it's a cloud-based crawling engine it's a database, it's a set of classification rules, it's a set of dimensions in your deployments. All in all, Genome is a tremendous amount of content and threat intelligence made available to the deep field applications in the form of two data sets. So you can see on one hand, Cloud Genome as uh, an internet services supply chain map, which allows deep field to provide full network and service visibility into traffic categories and applications relevant application FQDNs, uh, content delivery networks, hosting and service providers, consumer and IoT device types, and much more. And on the other hand, Secure Genome is a threat intelligence data feed that provides full visibility of internet security related data, uh, including DDoS reflectors, known DDoS attack vectors and botnets, piracy sites, and more and more, allows uh, also to, uh, well, deep field to accurately classify traffic as DDoS in real time, um, irrespective of the type of protocol and pattern used, uh, including amplification, reflection, and flooding attacks. Now, to build and maintain all this intelligence, um, the distributed uh, genome cloud engine actively crawls a very large portion of the IPv4 and IPv6 uh, addressable space to get valuable insights about each IP endpoint and tax them against applications, CDNs, device types, et cetera. It builds further insights by tracking large amounts of domain names and mapping them uh, you know, to the service they deliver. Uh, it complements this input with uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning techniques for automated classification and categorization of endpoints. And it continuously enhances uh, its classification accuracy by integrating with open and commercial external data sources. Now, the result of this um, is a massive but compact set of classification rules that are periodically download, uh, downloaded uh, and pulled by the deep field deployments around the world for an always up-to-date set of content classi classification rules, attack patterns, and associated mitigation strategies. So uh, there it is. Uh, you got a bit of a sneak peek into the secret sauce. Uh, and so finally, uh, let's take a quick look at where we are today at uh, DeepField, right? And so we have now uh, well over 50 customers and are present in all geographies. Uh, we're covering a large amount of use cases that are representative of where we're deployed with a good representation of large global and national tier one, tier two, and tier three service providers, cable providers, IXPs, and cloud web scale and large enterprises. So last but not least, we're also very proud of having received uh, you know, a significant uh, awards from, uh, well, for our innovative uh, security solutions by the Metro Ethernet Forum and the Broadband Forum uh, during uh, 2019. Um, and so, um, you know, if what we've talked about today sounded interesting, uh, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. We will be happy to welcome you at some point into the Deep Field family. Uh, so, with that, uh, we've reached the end of the session. Uh, thanks for your time, and we will now take your questions, uh, Alex. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, giving it back to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Gio. A very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, thanks so much for making all these points. Uh, we have uh, a, a group of faithful 
attendees that stayed uh, with us throughout the hour and we also have a number of very interesting questions uh, so some of them are fairly technical uh, let me just uh, answer a couple of them that are kind of related one of them was about uh, our insight into the launch of Disney Plus in the EU I think we covered that uh, earlier this year in uh, one of our blogs and we may have captured that in the report. So there's a lot of additional information which we didn't present in these presentations today that are uh, a part of our report. The report is more than 50 pages long, and it also contains a little bit of history over the last 10 years, how the internet changed uh, from, from our perspective. So I would uh, highly uh, recommend that you uh, download it, which is uh, listed in, in the list of your uh, resources here, and uh, take a, a deeper look into it. Uh, I do have a couple of technical questions, uh, Gil, that I will be passing your way. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, a couple of them are related, uh, and they're about uh, the real-time nature of our, of our insights. So one of them is really uh, how much of, of uh, how, how long do we display the flow data? I, I guess uh, the, the real question is how quickly can we show stuff uh, as, after we receive it from, 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 from the network? And uh, there is a similar question, then are we observing the five minute windows or what? Or, or what? And uh, maybe you can also address this from a security perspective. How quickly can we detect a DDoS anomaly if, if, uh, if, the, if when, when it happens? <laughs> sure, sure, Alex. Uh, I guess that's, uh, that's an all-in-one type of question. Uh, so I'll, I'll start by um, you know, talking about the, uh, you know, the granularity of our pipeline, right? So first of all, uh, because we're building our data based on the flow we get from the network, um, first we have to actually get that flow, right? So with um, S-Flow, for example, that is actually pretty much instantaneous. As soon as the switch samples a particular packet, it takes the headers uh, of that packet, it puts it on a flow record, and it shifts it over to deep field. Uh, and then DeepField can start doing its job. Um, in contrast, NetFlow uh, is typically cached. Uh, and this means that um, you know, it will take uh, an amount of seconds, the routers, to export flow. Now, typically, we recommend our customers to minimize both the act active and inactive NetFlow timers. So we get that data as soon as possible. And typically, the minimum active flow timer uh, supported by routers is around 60 seconds. And the minimum inactive uh, flow timer uh, is between 10 and 15 seconds. So it means as soon as you know, 10 or 15 seconds or up to a minute after the traffic has uh, you know, been crossing the network, um, we will be able to see that in deep field. We will get that data in deep field. Then our pipeline granularity is um, you know, 10 seconds. Um, well, the minimum pipeline granularity is 10 seconds. We build data in parallel for 10 seconds, 5 minutes, 30 minutes, 2 hours, and daily granularities. Uh, so for 10 seconds, when you're, for example, issuing a real-time query in deep field, um, every 10 seconds you will see the data that was produced, say, a you know, minute and so earlier uh, in, uh, in the network, right? So that was crossing uh, the traffic in the network. So something similar can be said for uh, DDoS detection, right? So as soon as we get the data, our DDoS pipeline granularity is also using 10 seconds. And so as soon as 10 seconds, we can uh, launch um, uh, basically a detection alert and we can start triggering mitigation actions uh, for attacks. Perfect, thanks. Well, it's all right you, to you. You, you, you're going to love this one. Can the values at each display level be adjusted or filtered? Can I filter only traffic for a specific site or for a particular OTT or a particular router? And maybe you can answer this from a perspective of what we consider the multi-dimensional view. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, so yes, Alex, as, as you mentioned, right, so, and, and a bit as discussed during the session, Deep field builds data uh, in parallel um, and classifies data in multiple dimensions at the same time. Typically, most deep field deployments are classifying data for over 70 dimensions uh, at the same time. And dimensions can be anything from you know, routers to pops to interfaces to categories to applications to CDNs, BGP prefixes, you know, access uh, types, uh, anything that we've talked about. Right? So each of those dimensions can then have 
large amounts, very large amounts of positions, right? So a position in the category that I mentioned would be one of the categories. So for example, web or video or gaming, right? So um, any, you can actually ask deep field any complex questions, multi-dimensional questions and choose which dimensions or positions to visualize, right? So you can, for example, send a query to understand what are uh, the peers sending traffic into my network and what are the applications coming into the network through each of these peers uh, for gaming traffic, right? So that would be filtering on gaming. So that would be one thing that you do on your query and then selecting two dimensions for visualization, which are peers and applications, right? Now, of course, you have two ways to explore data in deep field. One is system built in dashboards and the other one is completely free form data exploration. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, for the freeform data exploration, you're free to, uh, you know, build any queries that you like uh, with the multidimensional data that we're building. I hope that uh, helped clear uh, the question. Yes, it does. Uh, thanks. So uh, another interesting question, a couple of interesting questions. One of them is, what options does subscriber intelligence support in order to compl comply with the GDPR or uh, California Consumer Protection Act in the U.S.? So maybe All right, so if you, you don't tell me otherwise, I'll, I'll keep taking the questions unless you say Craig, okay? <laughs> All right, so for, for, this, um, for this part, uh, what we, uh, or what the field offers uh, in subscriber intelligence is a lot of knobs uh, to control uh, who has access to what information and what information do we build, right? So first of all, um, if you as a service provider were only interested in um, aggregate subscriber data, so never per subscriber data, but data by subscription plan or data by, uh, you know, uh, access uh, type or by speed tier, um, etc. cetera, um, then you can not choose not to build the per subscriber data. Um, if you um, then want to see, for example, or tackle use cases like what are my top subscribers doing versus my average subscribers, you may be able to do that with just fully anonymized per subscriber data, which we can support. Um, and then the third level of visibility is, of course, full subscriber data. Now, in between all of these, DeepField provides a lot of knobs, as mentioned, to control who has access to what data if the data is being built. So, for example, uh, marketing might only be allowed to see uh, aggregate data. Right, so uh, data by subscription plan, for example, while operations might be able to see data for all subscribers as long as a subscriber gives their consent. Or, uh, for example, even uh, in some cases, business intelligence might be able to access the data for subscribers that have opted into the service that have given their concern, uh, concern, <laughs> uh, consent. Right, so um, you know, hopefully that that helps. We provide the hooks for you to run, um, you know, privacy as uh, you would like. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, let's now switch to uh, Craig as, as you to balance things out. Uh, a couple of questions on the genome. Uh, Craig, maybe you can just give us a little bit of a history into uh, the deep field genome and, you know, what type of information, how do we construct it? Uh, I think uh, it's also worth clarifying that it's not run out of the customer deployments, but we run it using our own servers and we just provide the feed. So please go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So we started DeepField really with the understanding that internet traffic, even back five, six years ago, was moving to the cloud and changing very, very quickly. And the problem with Geno, excuse me, the problem with uh, internet traffic kind of moving the cloud and largely moving to CDN is that all of the traditional visibility mm -hmm. providers had either looking at ports or IP addresses or even with DPI as more and more traffic becomes encrypted, really providers starting to lose the key insights, the key engineering capabilities to ensure QE performance 
to be able to manage their networks. So we started Deep Field uh, now, as, as Alex mentioned, going back uh, you know a number of years, with the idea that we could take some techniques such as Google, the ability to crawl the internet, the ability to understand patterns, not within sort of payloads, but understand patterns and behaviors. How does Netflix build their service? How does YouTube build their service? Which CDNs, which hosting, which types of analytics? that would all allow us without any new hardware in the network to be able to build maps of CDN, of hosting, and maps of the services themselves to be able to very accurately at high scale without any additional hardware in the network build these genomic maps. Instead of the human genome, uh, we're now mapping internet traffic, internet data centers, uh, and internet applications. So we started building the genome, uh, and the genome, again, as Alex said, is largely crawling and other discovery that we do within the Nokia cloud, and that our customers have the option to download this map on a half-hour, hourly basis. And then when combined with the rest of the Nokia DeepField product and solution, provides very accurate application identification, uh, very accurate uh, quality QE bitrate application of all major European, North American, Asian uh, video and other applications. Great, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Craig. Uh, one question uh, is about the modes of deployment. It says, uh, does the DFIL deployment take uh, place locally in the country or uh, are the network you're deploying it or can it be run uh, from the cloud? And how long would uh, a possible implementation take from the moment that we decide to implement a, a deep field solution like you described? Again, yeah, another great question. So the answer is both. Uh, we, we do have a number of customers that are per, uh, purely software as a service uh, that basically through secure VPN can interconnect with one of the Nokia data centers and provide data to their own secure uh, you know, sandboxed uh, instances in the cloud. And then we have uh, quite a few providers that have chosen within their own data center, behind their own firewalls, to deploy their own servers and run the deep field servers within their network. Uh, clearly, you know, uh, deployments in the cloud can be significantly faster than deployments on-prem. Uh, we have had deployments up in just a matter of days or even hours. Uh, typically, the issue with on-premise deployment is simply providers provisioning servers and setting up their infrastructure, including configuring routers, uh, potentially DNS and others to be able to send data to the deep field cluster. Thanks so much. Uh, and maybe we should close with this one because it's a kind of interesting question. Uh, back to Guy, uh, you mentioned cord cutting uh, prediction in one of your slides. Can you just provide a little bit more insight? How does how this work for for a service provider that that would potentially be looking to predict the cord cutters from their network? Yeah, so there's, uh, of course, the, the details uh, of the engine and algorithms that are used for this uh, typically are the responsibility and controlled and only known uh, by the service providers themselves. Everyone uses different mechanisms or insights. Um, however, what we, you know, what we know uh, and, and that is typically done is understand which subscribers and group of subscribers um, are using, um, you know, third party uh, OTT services, uh, third-party streaming services, uh, which uh, subscribers haven't been, haven't been using it for a while, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, which subscribers have, for example, even reduced, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, you know, their service um, uh, or their broadband speed. Uh, these are all indications that they're not looking at, uh, you know, an increased usage of the higher demand, uh, you know, service that is video, right? Thanks. Just uh, one quick one. Do Are you able uh, with your genome to look at the IoT domain? So do we track IoT devices? Maybe, maybe a question for Craig. 
Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, so we are tracking IoT both from a you know discovery for providers trying to understand what is in their network, and certainly from a security perspective. As I mentioned during my presentation, we continue to see IoT as a really, really quickly growing source of denial of service attacks uh, within the provider, as well as a range of other security threats. So we do identify uh, IoT traffic, and we do particularly uh, have a focus on IoT from a security perspective. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we do have a number of additional questions, but in the interest of time, we've already gone over our uh, kind of planned 80 minutes to cover uh, this very interesting topic. Uh, so I would like to thank our speakers, Craig and Gil, for their time and uh, fantastic uh, sessions, presentations, and also even more so to all of you who stayed online and watched this, uh, or joined us in this webinar today. Uh, as we mentioned, the, the recording of the webinar will be available uh, for on-demand watching at a later time, and we will get back to you with uh, uh, the PDF of the slides that we used today, so you will be able to see them in better detail. I apologize for a slight glitch. It seems that it was the audio on my part, and uh, that just required us to uh, stop for a second and, and continue. Uh, we will, and also, as mentioned, we will be continuing conducting a, a series of shorter 30-minute webinars on specific topics, uh, starting with video uh, streaming, then video conferencing and VPN, gaming, and uh, data security between December, early December and February. So please join us in, in these uh, focused events. Uh, we hope to provide also additional uh, insights as we learn them from service providers who are using uh, the DField portfolio. Uh, with that in mind, I'd also like to thank our logistical uh, support team today and hope to uh, continue uh, uh, hearing from you. Thanks so much.